one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our August webinar, your ATE proposal guide evaluation. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the ATE Evaluation Resource Center at Western Michigan University. We're offering this webinar again this coming Tuesday at 3 p.m. If you have colleagues who you think um, might be interested in the webinar, please send them to our website to register. I'm Kristen Martens, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. With me here at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is Lori Wingate, the Director of Evaluate. Also joining us today is Gerhard Salinger, who after almost 25 years recently retired as a program officer at the National Science Foundation. During his tenure, he helped actually develop the ATE program. He was also a program officer in the Division of Research on Learning, funding proposals in materials development and teacher professional development for secondary schools. Also joining us today is Asa Bradley who teaches physics at Spokane Falls Community College in Spokane, Washington. Last year, as part of the Mentor Connect pilot project, she completed an application for an NSF small grant for institutions new to the ATE program called Rebranding the 21st Century IT Technician. Asa interviewed several external evaluators before choosing Terrell Bailey of the Allison Group to work with her team which she says turned out to be one of the best decisions she thinks she's ever made. And that brings us to Terrell Bailey, who is the founder and president of the Allison Group in Seattle, Washington. Collaborative evaluation with the systems thinking component are areas of focus in her practice. Terrell has been involved with the National Science Foundation's advanced technological education program for 15 years as a workforce development consultant and external evaluator. During the webinar, if you have questions or comments that you would like fielded by a specific person on our panel, just note, that, just note the name that you would like to have answer your question or to pose your comment to, and we'll do so at our question breaks. Behind the scenes, we want to make sure that you know that this webinar um, is running smoothly because we have Mike Lasecki from Maytech at Maricopa Community Colleges. And please note that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Science Foundation. This webinar has been developed specifically for individuals who are interested in developing proposals for NSF's ATE program. And so everyone most likely already knows that ATE stands for Advanced Technological Education. To orient you to the structure of today's webinar, you can see that we're in the midst of intro introductions and housekeeping because it's highlighted by the red place mark. We'll move next into our panelist tips for a successful ATE proposal. And then the webinar has three main sections. And Lori Wingate will be leading those sections. We'll have check, a check-in with you in the form of an anonymous quiz. And then we'll hear from our panelists again, followed by a question break. So all three of the webinar sections will follow the same pattern. We will conclude with closing remarks and very importantly a chance for you to give us your feedback through an online survey which will be available immediately following the presentation. After that, we wish you the best of luck with your proposal. And if you have questions after the webinar, we invite you to contact us with your questions or continue the dialogue on Facebook. So let's finish up with the housekeeping and we'll have a brief orientation to our webinar system. This webinar is presented through Blackboard, and it's clear by the hands that are being raised that many of you are already familiar with Blackboard functions. But for those of you who may be new to the webinar system, this is a screenshot of what you should see on the left of your screen. So if you notice that there's a hand icon um, to raise your hand, you just click on the icon. Just below is the participants box. This box lists everyone who is attending the webinar. At the bottom left is the chat box. And this is very important if you um, want to ask questions or post comments. You'll do so in this chat box. The presenters will then address them at our scheduled question and answer breaks. So you can post your questions and, and comments at any time, and I'll keep track of the submissions so that we can address them um, when we do have the breaks. And remember, if you have someone that you'd specifically like to address your question to, note who that is. 
To ensure that everyone can follow the chat conversation, which we really encourage everyone to participate in, be sure that the Room tab is selected. This tab is located below the chat box to the far left. So let's practice using the Room chat box now. So please type the name of the organization that you are from and how many people are viewing the webinar in the room with you today. We have a polling question today, so we want to make sure that you know how to um, use the polling um, icon. And we want to make sure you don't type the answer into the chat box. Instead, navigate to the icon to the right of the hand and select the letter that coincides with your answer. So let's practice a poll. Go ahead and select the response that best describes you or your team. A, if you're submitting your first ATE proposal. B, if you have submitted an ATE proposal before but it's not been funded. C, if you've already had an ATE grant. Or D, none of the above. Hey, Mike, can we show the results? All right, there we go. We have quite a few people that are none of the above. And if that's the case, if you get a chance, why don't you go ahead and use the chat box to tell us a little bit about what brought you here to our webinar today? The last tool I want to show you is the marker tool. And to use the marker tool, you first click on the marker icon, which appears just to the right of the, of the participants box. And then you can select the color that you want to use. So let's try that now. On this map, use the marker tool to indicate your location using um, the color that you select. If you're joining us from outside the U.S., make your mark off the coast in the direction of your location. So it looks like we're spanning the U.S., nobody outside yet. Oh. All right, very nice. So to accompany the webinar, we have created an evaluation planning checklist, which you may want to check out after the webinar. It's on our website now, as well as a PDF of the webinar slides. This webinar is being recorded, and we'll email you the link for the recording when it's available, which commonly takes one or two days. As a side note, if you're viewing a recording of the webinar, you won't see the chat box conversation. By the end of the webinar, it's our intent that you will know what evaluative ele elements should be included in a proposal and where, and understand how evaluation can be leveraged to strengthen a proposal. Remember, you can type your comments or questions in the chat box at any time, and we'll go over those at the question break. And now I'll turn things over to Gerhard, who will start us off with some advice about developing an ATE proposal. Good morning, afternoon. Um, as as uh, Kristen said, I was a program officer at, in the ATE program for many years. Uh, I've since retired from the National Science Foundation, and I should insist and declare that the views here are my own, may or may not agree with those of the National Science Foundation. There's three, four, a few general comments. One is to be careful to read the solicitation, read it carefully, understand what it says, and make sure your project fits within it. Uh, another important aspect is to demonstrate awareness of other similar work and how you build on it. So many proposals just start saying, we have this great idea, but uh, that doesn't say where, where it fits in, in the general um, scheme of things. I have a colleague who said, when she wrote her thesis, when she said she had a really new idea, her thesis advisor would say, you really haven't read the literature. Um, and then I think an important aspect is to try to complete your a draft, try to get an almost complete draft of your proposal done early enough that you can have someone familiar with NSF programs, particularly ATE, but not familiar with your project, to read your proposal and make comments. You think you said something. Uh, you may or may not have, and having another pair of eyes would help make a stronger proposal. 
think those are the major things I want to say at this time. Great. Thank you, Gerhard. Um, also, what advice would you give to ATE proposers? Um, I think I'll echo what Gerhard said about um, getting um, a complete draft, an almost complete draft done early so that you can get feedback from uh, people both familiar and maybe not familiar to the NSF program. Um, and um, keeping it focused on what the common goal is. Uh, we, when we applied for our grant, did three separate components that that might not seem like they're connected, um, but they were working towards one common goal. And so always keeping that common goal and focus during our uh, project description helped us, I think, um, when it came time for um, reviews and also people understanding what it was that we wanted to, to do. And then getting the reviews showed us where we weren't um, working towards that common goal, where it wasn't clear how it was going to, uh, how what we were trying to do was going to accomplish the goal. And then also, if you get your draft proposal done early enough, that will really help your evaluator when you go and look for an evaluator to better give you um, feedback on what they can do for you, uh, and also how you can, um, what kind of evaluation plan you should come up with, and what kind of logic model you should come up with. Um, and then they can also give you feedback on um, what sections in your project proposal you should massage a little bit to better fit with, um, to be easier to evaluate or even being possible to evaluate, and then also feed into the evaluation plan so that you get a seamless um, a sort of communication between those sections as well. That's what I would recommend. Great. Well, thank you so much, Asa. Um, Carol, what advice would you give to ATE proposers? Thanks. Make sure you unmute. There you are. Yes, I'm unmuted. Um, thank you. I, I, I guess I would say is, you know, external evaluator is external to the project, not part of the project team, has an arm's length relationship with evaluation. But in the proposal development phase, um, you can think of your evaluator more like a partner, more like someone who can really help to develop the proposal, not just the evaluation section, but the whole thing. As, as Asa was saying, there's, there's ways that um, the evaluator can bring a perspective into the, the whole proposal. Um, and uh, so that's, that would be my starting advice. Thank you so much. And so we'll go ahead and move into um, the first part, the content of our webinar. Lori? Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and you know, I think proposal development is a really exciting time, whether you're doing your first one or you're, you've been doing this for many years. It's always exciting to see an idea come to fruition and see a team come together and develop your vision and, and be able to you know, think about some resources being infused and being able to support what you want to do. So I hope you're excited about it. Um, we're going to be submitting another proposal for our renewal next year, so I'm already thinking about it. And I wish the, luck, the best of luck to all of you. And, just following on the others with regard to advice, um, I have tried to put everything I have I can offer with regard to advice about evaluation into the checklist that Kristen mentioned. And so that's what we're pretty much going to be going through today. Um, and it looks like this. It's organized by proposal component. It doesn't list all the proposal components, just the section where you're going to need to provide information related to your evaluation. So I'm just wondering how many, we sent this out yesterday to folks who were registered um, as of yesterday morning. I'm wondering how many of you may have had a chance to look this over. Just give me a hand raise if you have. We have a lot of hands going up. That's great. Um, I hope you find it helpful. Um, I, I actually use it myself. And if you have feedback at any point, you know, just feel free to email me. We're continually improving uh, the materials we put forth. So hope you find it helpful and don't hesitate to ask any questions today about it. So here's the required content of an NSF proposal. And this is according to the NSF grant proposal guide. Uh, the red checks here, these red checks, identify those components where there should be information related to your evaluation. And we're going to be discussing how to incorporate the evaluative elements into each of these sections to strengthen your proposal and hopefully increase your chances for a favorable review. So I'm going to go through these components right in the order that you see them here. But where would we actually want to start in reality when we start our proposal development project? Which of these components? Just use the chat box 
to let me know what you think. We start at the top, cover sheet. Okay, a couple of people saying project description. Yeah, we, we can't necessarily do this in a linear process. We've got to start with our idea. Um, after we get our idea somewhat going, then where would we go? The next most important thing, probably. Getting administration to agree, says Max. Good point. Don't want to get too far before you have buy-in from your institution. Joanne says budget. Perfect. Right. So you have your idea, you're developing your idea, but you've got to have a reality check, right, to make sure that you can actually pull off what you want to with the with the resources available. And then, of course, as um, Howard is mentioning, get those re references in as you're building your project description. Good point. So the first place your proposal is going to um, have something to do related to evaluation is your cover sheet. And that is automatically generated as you provide answers to questions in the Fastlane system. Uh, evaluation is going to show up here in the form of this little box um, which asks about human subjects. Let's see if I can star that right there. If you're going to be collecting information from or about human subjects, or as I like to call them people, you're going to have to um, deal with this by contacting your Human Resources Institutional Research Board. So we're going to call it HSIRB. So you'll check the box. And what you'll probably need to do at this point, um, at, your, at the time you're developing your proposal, is to indicate that the approval is pending if you haven't submitted and gotten your approval yet, which is kind of hard to do when you're just at the proposal stage. But please be aware, you will need that HSIRB approval before your grant is awarded by NSF. So you don't want this to catch you by surprise when you first hear from NSF that it sounds like they're going to um, support your proposal, but they need your IRB. So get the ball rolling on that as much as you can in advance. But you can just indicate pending at the time of your proposal. So next is the project summary. This document is going to be used by NSF program officers to determine how to group the proposals they get and assign them to reviewers. So you want to start off with a really strong, really clear and specific statement about what your project's about, who it's going to serve. Um, in fact, you might want to try just to put all that right in the first sentence. Make it easy on those program officers. Tell them what your disciplinary focus is, who your audience is, and what are your main activities. Get it right there up front. Basically, in one page you need to provide an overview of your activities, like I just said. Um, and importantly, statements about your pro proposal's intellectual merit and broader impacts. So if you've been around NSF for a while, you've heard those terms and you're kind of familiar with them probably. If you haven't, you want to do a little more research on your own to figure out what they mean for your project. And also, there, um, those are the main review criteria, but there's lots of sub-criteria under those. And you probably can't address those all in a one-page document, so you want to focus on the ones that are going to be the most relevant to your project. So if we boil it down, intellectual merit is really about, and this is NSF's definition, the project's potential to advance knowledge. And broader impacts is about the project's potential to benefit society, make the world a better place. And you should also be aware in the ATE program has some specific sub-criteria that's related to evaluation. For example, they ask, is the evaluation plan clearly tied to project outcomes? Does the project provide for effective assessment of student learning? Is the evaluation likely to provide useful information to the project and others? And similarly, under broader impact, will it communicate the results to others? And so the fact that the ATE program has incorporated evaluation concerns right into its review criteria, that should be a strong clue to you of how, just how important it is to your proposal. Okay, so it, in this list of components. Next is the project description. And this is that 15-page narrative that really makes up the bulk of your proposal. And you have a lot of ground to cover in these 15 pages. Basically, what I have listed here are the key elements that are going to go in that 15-page project description. There's two places where evaluation needs to figure prominently. And that's results of prior support and, of course, your evaluation plan. So let's look at results of prior support first. So basically, the rule is if the PI or the co-PI on the proposal you're developing has received prior funding from NSF and it's related to the current proposal, you have to start the project description with the section titled 
results from prior support. And you can see from this quote, um, NSF expects you to describe your previous project's outcomes and results. And reviewers are going to be looking for evidence of the quality and effectiveness of your prior work. The NSF grant proposal guide says this section should be organized under two main headings, which again are intellectual merit and broader impacts. And this is where you're going to provide your results your evaluation results from a past project if you had one. So keep in mind that not all of the evaluation results may be considered equally uh, compelling by reviewers, so you might need to be selective in what you report. And give priority to those higher level impacts. For example, if you have data on student outcomes, that's going to be more interesting, more compelling, more convincing than, for example, if you have data on your website hits or satisfaction rating, something like that. So I have a little exercise. I want you to put yourself in the position of, of, a, of a proposal reviewer at NSF. And you've got a lot of proposals to review. So think about what's going to be um, the most compelling types of evidence to include in a results of prior support section. Now, I want to point out here, if I understand that not all of you have already have an ATE grant. You may not have a prior project. But the reason this is relevant um, is because quite likely, if you do get funded, you're going to go for another grant. So you already want to be thinking about what you might, be, what kinds of evidence you might be able to include here in your next go around. And for those of you who are submitting um, a continuation grant or, or a second, um, even a new kind of initiative, um, you want to take this section very seriously. So here are some statements, and I'm going to ask Mike to bring up the marker tools for everyone. And I'd basically just like you to take a moment to read each one and indicate if you think the statement would be compelling to you as a reviewer as evidence of a project's intellectual merit and broader impact of previously funded work. So if you think yes, you can mark in this column here. And if you think no, you can mark here. You can just use your markers just like you did on the map. So I'll give you a moment to do that. Great. I see you guys have the hang of the markers. I really like using the markers as a tool in webinars because there's no risk to you of being embarrassed by giving in. Uh, there's certainly no wrong answers in this one, but sometimes there might be wrong or right answers or, or something that's out of line. And so using the marker tool, there's no risk. Nobody knows who's, who's marking where. So let's think about each of these. Okay. First of all, the project, prior project achieved all of its goals. So this is a statement I would put in my results of prior support. You should fund me because our prior project achieved all of its goals. Well, that's very good and it's important. But if I don't, you don't have evidence to back that up and show to be able to really demonstrate that you actually achieved your goals and they made a difference in the world, then I would not feel that this was a super compelling uh, thing to put in my results of prior support section. Fine thing to say, just have some evidence to back it up. Okay, second one. The PIs and co-PIs published four peer-reviewed articles based on data generated by the project. Also had some mixed um, thoughts here. My thinking was that this is actually pretty good, tangible, hard evidence that you accomplished something with NSF funding. Um, and in fact, listing publication is, it is asked for in the results of prior support section. So you should definitely um, include that information if you have that kind of achievement. Third one, the project developed three lab manuals and provided faculty with professional development and served 125 students. And we have somebody I think was impressed with the numbers there. Um, so this is good, but and this would be an, definitely an important thing to report, but I would also want to push things a bit further and say, okay, so what happened as a result of all this work? What did the faculty do with that professional development? What difference did this make for students? So this is a good thing to say, but take it a bit further with your evidence if you can. And finally, the project supported internships for 75 students, and more than half of them got full-time positions. So a lot of agreement here that this is pretty strong evidence. So I think you kind of get the hang of this. Like make those statements and back it up with evidence. And it's not really about what you did. It's about what difference you made because of your grant. So well, thanks for doing that. Um, I just want to go back to this slide for a second. In what other document do you need to discuss intellectual merit and broader impact? We've been really focusing on results of prior support, but we've talked about it elsewhere. What other document was that that goes into your proposal? 
just use your chat box. I know you remember. There's somebody out there who knows. Amanda and Howard, Allie, do you want, Allie, thank you. Yes, project summary. We need to talk about intellectual merit and broader impacts in the project summary and the prior support. And I think this is it's quite convenient, actually. Um, when you go to write your next proposal, this is what I suggest. You pull out that project summary that you wrote as, as in a prospective way. This is what we seek to achieve. And rewrite it in the past tense with evidence. Does that make sense? So the project summary, you're saying this is what we're going to do. This is the difference we're going to make. This is how we're going to advance knowledge and improve society. Right? You're thinking prospectively. And then when you write, write your results of prior support section, you need to address those same things. Just do it in, in a retrospective way with evidence. Hope that makes sense to you guys. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a bit. We're still in the project description here, and that's the main piece of your proposal package. But we're going to skip all the way down to the evaluation plan. As you can see, there's a lot of important elements that you're going to need to address from the rationale for the proposal all the way through sustainability and dissemination. But we're here to talk today about evaluation, obviously. And I want to um, point out that the solicitation includes some specific expectations for evaluation of different kinds of projects. There are slightly different um, statements about evaluation in the different program tracks, like whether you're submitting something for materials development or professional development. But we're not going to get into those nuances in this webinar, so I just want to make sure like, you follow the <laughs> advice that our panelists gave you. Make sure you read that solicitation carefully and that you're responsive to it. So what goes into an evaluation plan? Well, I think you've got to put in three, three main things. You need to have information about your evaluator. You have to have the plan itself. And then you need to show that there's integration of evaluation throughout your proposal in things like biosketches and logic models and data management plans. And we'll talk about those. Now remember the evaluation plan is just one to three pages of your 15 page narrative. So the first thing you want to do is identify your evaluator. Who is going to evaluate the project and briefly describe his or her experience and their expertise related to the work that you're doing. And I'm just talking briefly, just like, you know, a couple sentences up to a paragraph here. So the ATE solicitation does specify that the funds to support an evaluator independent of the project or center must be requested. So a common question that proposers ask is, well, how do I find an evaluator? It's not like there's a listing of them in the yellow pages is totally true. So how do we find an independent evaluator? Well, your re best resource may well be other ATE PI's recommendations. A good bet is to ask a center PI. Those are the larger grants. They tend to have more experience with evaluation. And you can get a listing of all the ATE centers and the PI's from the ATE central website. And that link is on our checklist that we mentioned. Um, the American Evaluation Association also maintains a national directory of evaluators. And it's conveniently searchable by keyword and region. Um, those links, again, are on, in our checklist. Wherever you are, you may not be all that far from a large university. And you can just do a little asking around to see if they have a, a research center or an institute that may engage in evaluation work. But remember, these sources are just going to provide leads for you. Just because an evaluator is in a directory or is recommended by another PI, it doesn't mean they're necessarily the right person for your project. You have to determine that person's qualifications and fit for your project for yourself. Um, in just a little bit, we're going to have um, our panelists come on again. And Asa is going to share with us about how she located and selected her evaluator, Carol, who's also a panelist with us today. So on that note, I just want to do a quick check-in about where we are in our webinar today. Um, we're about to do our first little quiz, which is also going to be anonymous, so no stressing here. And then we're going to hear from our panelists again. And after that, we have our first question break. So if you have questions or comments, um, please go ahead and type them in the chat box now, and then Kristen can kind of keep track of them and be able to present them um, at our break. So for the quiz, we're going to use the marker tool again. So if Mike could make those available. So this is a true-false question. Um, you're just going to use your markers to circle the answer you think is the best one. So HSIRB approval may be submitted to NSF at any time as long as it's before data are collected from human subjects. Is this a true statement or not true?
Wonderful. Yep, you guys are paying attention. This is not true. Do not wait. Um, you will have to get your HSIRB approvals um, on file at NSF before they make your award. You cannot promise that you're going to get it before you collect any data. You have to have it on file before you have an award. And this can be a fairly um, complex process. So I would not, I would not wait. Um, you want to get the ball rolling on that. Uh, at least find out what the requirements are so that you're really well prepared to get the ball rolling once you do hear from NSF that, that, it's not, that you're likely to be um, funded. Okay. Second question. No right or wrong here, just it's opinion, agree or disagree. The most important thing to do in a results of prior support section is to indicate how many people your project served. What do you think? Okay, pretty much unanimous uh, being disagreeing there. Yeah, it's certainly a good thing to mention that, but you do have to push it farther and I would not say it is the most important thing. You always want to think about you know, not just what you did, how many people you reached, how many of this or that uh, you generated, but what difference you, you made. Okay, final question. NSF maintains a directory of approved evaluators on its website. You got it. There is no such directory. It would be great if there was. Um, we here at Evaluate for a while had a, a directory of ATE evaluators and uh, fairly problematic in trying to maintain that. Um, so we are phasing it out and we're going to re be replacing it with the LinkedIn group. And, and part of the challenge of that was people really expecting and wanting that to be a vetted uh, list of evaluators and, and us not really being in a position to do that. So there, it is still um, quite the responsibility of of pr proposers to find evaluators and to do the work to make sure they're the right for your project. So thanks for doing that. I hope that was fun. Hope you had fun. So we're going to hear from our panelists next. Um, first, Oss is going to come on, and then uh, Terrell, who is going to provide the evaluator's perspective, and then Gerhard um, will conclude, and then we'll have our question break. So Asa. Um Yeah, hello again. Um, I don't think I mentioned, but uh, the reason we uh, did our grant was because we'd gotten chosen to be in the pilot program for Mentor Connect, where we actually got um, matched up with a mentor that really took us through the process of how to apply for an ATE grant, um, especially people that are, are new to the ATE process. I think we actually had to be, we'd never received an ATE grant before. And so um, I had a lot of people to ask for recommendations for evaluators. Um, so that was the first thing I did. And then I also went to the um, evalu external evaluators has a professional networking organization. So I went to their website um, and uh, looked in the directory and looked for evaluators that were close to the Pacific Northwest, which is where I am, so that because uh, I knew I wouldn't have very much money in a small grant budget for external evaluators. Um, and then I contacted five different evaluators um, and sent out a bunch of questions that I had also found on an evaluator um, website that were good to ask your um, evaluators. And then uh, based on the questions that I got back, um, I interviewed um, each one of them as well and had a, a sort of more in-depth conversation about their idea about evaluation and um, how they could help us with our project. And some of the questions I had asked were, do you have experience with a project like ours? And so this is when it was really helpful that I had most of the project description already done. And because of the Mentor Connect program, we had really kick-started that in January on the application to do in October. And so I was evaluating evaluators in August. And I kind of wish that we would have started even a little bit earlier than that. Um, but that's when we brought our external evaluator on board. And then um, I selected the person that I communicated the best with because remember you're going to you know, spend the next three years or more with this person. You're going to be doing a lot of report writing and uh, things going into NSF. So I wanted somebody that I could communicate well with and that seemed to be on the same wavelength as me. Um, and, then I, I, and that person was also the one that had the best experience. Um, and um, the reason, one of the reasons why I chose Terrell was because um, she wasn't rigid in her plan. Um, some of the people that came back to me basically gave me a procedure list that told me this is the way that we do evaluation and we do not 
deviate from the plan. And so that wasn't a very good communicating protocol for me. Um, so I contacted the evaluation in August. The grant was due in October. Um, and that worked out fairly well for us. But I kind of wish we would have been able to give Terrell a little bit more time to give feedback on our project description and then maybe also the plan itself, the evaluation part of the plan that, that is. Um, so yeah, that was my story. Thank you, Asa. Let's turn it over to Terrell to see what she has to comment on. Uh, thanks very much, Kristen. So um, I, I was surprised at the number of questions that they had asked when I uh, received the questionnaire from Asa. I knew, and it was a small project, but they, they had a good dozen or more questions, and they were all good ones. Um, so I, uh, I answered each one as sincerely and completely as I could. And I also included um, philosophy of evaluation, um, my background with ATE overall, and also my background with IT projects in particular, and also the um, IT skill standards and work I had done with the National Workforce Center for Emerging Technologies here in the Pacific Northwest, which um, of course Spokane Falls had in common with me. So, um, you know, after hearing what Asa just said, it seems like that was what they were looking for. Thanks, Carol. Now let's hear from Gerhard. Thank you. Um, I'd like to reinforce a few points that, that Laurie made. Uh, one of them has to do with the project summaries. Uh, you can picture what happens. Uh, the ATE program re receives some 200, 250 proposals, and one has, the program officers have to decide in which panel, a panel reviewing a dozen to 20 proposals, depending on how we do it, into which panel this proposal should go. And there's a fairly short timeline to do this. So you want to tell the, the pr program officers right away uh, what your project is about, what's the content, what's the audience, uh, a few things like that, so that they can make that decision very quickly. If you start talking about other things and down below you finally get there, the program officer may not have read that far. So. Uh, this first sentence, I think, is very important, uh, and you want to think about it. Um, the other thing in, in the evaluation, the, the questions which uh, you, you were asked to uh, respond to were very much, what did you do? And if you only say those things in a proposal, uh, the reviewers are going to say, and what? Uh, so they really want to know what's the impact and effectiveness of what you've done. Uh, increased student learning, uh, p uh, faculty taking from, from workshops and using them in classes and finding that students learn better. Anything you can get in, in that realm. And that's, not as, and that's harder than just giving you numbers. Um, so you, you not only want to talk about outputs, but outcomes. Uh, another thing I would bring up is that <clears throat> very often you can also uh, use very well an, an, an internal evaluator who works with the external evaluator, who can, can uh, help design instruments, who can help uh, take the data, do an initial analysis, uh, so the external evaluator in some ways can act like a meta-evaluator. Uh, but that, and that, I think, has advantages both in terms of cost and in terms of, of getting feedback very directly. Uh, I did check a little on the, as, uh, policies on the IRB and the Institutional Review Board, and uh, what Lori says is absolutely correct. You cannot, the, the Division of Grants and Agreements will not accept a proposal that does not have a, a, a complete uh, either approval or exemption by the Institutional Review Board. The thing that, that may be slightly different is that you really only need to have in there what you will do in the first year. And so if you're going to take more data in the second year, you may be able to, to postpone that. In fact, you're supposed to have your Institutional Review Board uh, 
updated every year. And so if a lot of data, more data is being taken the second, third year, you really only have to say what's going to happen in the first year. I think those Thank are the so questions. Great. Thank you so much, Gerhard. We do have quite a few questions, so um, we'll, we'll uh, go ahead and launch right into them. Um, we have one from Asa from Leslie. She's wondering, how did you comply with your college's contracting or bidding procedures while selecting an evaluator? Um, I don't think it, uh, we had our, uh, our college administration, one of the things that we did as part of the Mentor Connect program was really build a grants team on campus and identifying everybody who needed to be involved in the procedure so that uh, people coming after me or after us doing grants would sort of have a flow chart on, on every uh, department and office that needed to be involved in, within our district. And so I worked really closely with them. And so there wasn't really an opportunity for me to not be in compliance because they were always on board. Um, but uh, if I, and Terrell might be able to answer this question better, but I think she is just part of our grant budget. And so it wasn't an issue in terms of um, our college having to bring her on as a contractor because she is getting paid from our grant, not from the college itself. Okay, great. And there were Kristen, quite a few questions, Asa. Oh, go ahead. Kristen, can I can I chime in on this because it is apparently is a, a concern in various ways. There is an, an Office of Management and Budget circular for contracts, and it is for contracts. Most evaluators are being hired as consultants or sub-awards. These are not contracts, and they are reported on line G3 and G5 of the budgets, respectively. Contracts would be under G6. That's, and if you look at the budget page, you'll see where these are under other uh, issues. The, and, and even in a bidding process, the PI does not have to choose the least expensive uh, proposal. Uh, if if there are good reasons not to. Now this is a federal viewpoint, and apparently schools do, and may have different rules which then trump the federal guidelines, but proposers should really point out the difference to their sponsored research office about evaluators and, and uh, is, is either consultants or on sub-awards. And if you propose review several evaluators and choose one, this may be sufficient to meet the school rule. Um, so the, the, the OMB is, is a federal rule, but schools do have different rules. Go. Okay, great. Um, then, Gerhard, I'm going to launch into, since you just brought up the um, OMB, Linda Misix emailed a question that I believe you can address, and she says, I've been reading the new Office of Management and Budget Uniform Guidance and articles describing the changes, and some experts are saying that based on the uniform guidance, you should not be naming evaluators in the grant proposal because you need to have this service put out for bids if you get the grant. Now, this is contrary to what NSF and other federal agencies have been telling us, so can you clarify? Yeah, I, I tried to do that in my comment that, that the the OMB circular is about contracts at the federal level, and that most projects do not make a contract with the evaluator. It's really just a consulting agreement or a sub-award. And so those, those are different. Uh, you have to convince, I think, your, your school, if, if the school goes along with it, there's no problem. But if your, your uh, sponsored research office um, feels that it's a contract and you're going to have to educate them a bit and, and uh, try to do it. But what we really do in a proposal want to see a, a, who the evaluator is and what the evaluation plan is. Okay, great. Thanks for the clarification. Also, uh, there are quite a few questions about whether or not you're willing to share your list of questions for the evaluator um, questions. Yes. yes, absolutely. And I think I, I sent um, like the sample email that I sent to evaluators um, to Emma already, but I can send it again. I'll send it to Emma, Lori, and Kristen, and then maybe you guys can send it out to the people that were um, that were in the webinar today. Lovely. Thank Does you so work? much. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Um, Lori, I believe there's a change in the solicitation with regard to results of prior support for centers. Can you tell us about that change? 
Sure. I actually just uh, talked about that in our most recent newsletter. It's just a small thing, but it may. It, I think it, it's just for national centers going for renewal grants. So if you already had a grant as a national center within the ATE program, you now have the option of including your results of prior support section in the supplementary documents. So all other all other proposals have to embed that in the the 15 page project narrative, and you have up to five pages you can use for that. But now centers who are renewing have the option of including it in supplementary documents, and then they can use more of their uh, project description sp space to talk about what they're going to do rather than what they've done in the past. So just a small tweak in the rules there. Okay, great. Well, we better move into the second section of the webinar. So I'm going to hand it back off to Lori. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone. Great question. So in this part of the webinar, we're really going to dig into the evaluation plan itself. So we've talked about identifying your evaluator, and yes, that is still something that you need to do up front and very clearly in your proposal. And now you're going to need to provide some detail about the evaluation plan itself. There, in my opinion, there's going to be four key pieces to any evaluation plan. It's going to need to define the focus of the evaluation, the data collection plan, the procedures for analyzing and interpreting data, and the reporting schedule and the projected uses. I might suggest that the people who aren't presenting put their phones on mute because I'm getting a little background noise. Okay. So first you need to clarify what aspects of the project are going to be evaluated. It's really critical to make sure the evaluation's focus is well aligned with what the project is going to do and try to achieve. Remember that's actually one of the ATE specific review criteria. For example, if your project is focused on developing students' entrepreneurial skills, it wouldn't make sense for you to invest your evaluation resources, which are going to be limited in assessing their learning in their, in their technical content areas, for example. You really want to align what you're assessing with what your projects really focus on in terms of impact. So how many of you are familiar with logic models? Just raise your hands if you have some experience with them. Okay, a lot of people, a little, so more than, at least half, about half. Um, I, I would like you to use a chat box. For those of you who have used them before, what you see as the benefits of using a logic model. Or if you're of the opposite opinion, you can tell us what you think about, about the, um, the drawbacks of using logic models. We'd like to hear from you here. Okay, Samantha is saying it drives clarity on activities and outcomes. Absolutely, that's a point I'm definitely going to be making here. Um, organization, seeing the big picture in one graphic, definitely. Providing an outline for the parts of the narrative, helping to focus on outcomes. Claudia is saying difficult to get faculty buy-in, good point, but again, clarifies for others. Graphical presentation, Kate saying showing alignment, activities and outcomes. So you guys really get this. Um, and you may need to do a little bit, bit of work to convincing others on your campuses because it does take it does take time to do. But I think they're extremely helpful for both for project design and for evaluation planning. I think they really help to bring the key aspects of projects into sharper relief, or really pop them out and check to make sure that you're actually have logical connections between the activities and the intended outcomes. Also mentioned, you know, that they had three things they were trying to do, and it really was helpful to stay focused on that overall goal. And the logic model can help convey that. They aren't required for ATE proposals, but I think they're, um, they are for some other NSF pro programs. And I do think they can bring value to, to your proposal. It's simply, simply, as somebody else said, a graphical depiction of what your project's doing and trying to achieve and how those things link together. There are a lot of different ways to design logic models, and they can get real, you know, fairly complicated sometimes. This, the one that I'm showing you here, is extremely basic. Um, it's for a fictional project we're calling the Green Energy Technology Institute. So we're just going to use this example in this section. So we're going to, and we're going to look at each component. So you don't need to worry about taking it all in right now. So we'll start with the activities column. It's not unusual for logic models to start with the inputs, basically the resources that are brought to bear on the project. I I um I think that's fine, but I I would make it worth your while. Like if you're just going to put college faculty and NSF funding and advisory committee, that's probably not the level of, of detail that's going to be helpful for understanding what you're doing. Um, so I'm starting with activities. 
In this column, you want to convey the main things you're going to do with your grant dollars. And here in this example, we have things like workshops and lectures and dissemination. This is the doing. I find it useful to include outputs. Not everybody does in their logic models. These are basically the tangible things that are going to be generated by the project activities. These are things you can see and count and document quite directly. For example, here we have the faculty of participate in training. We have a set of modules. We have a model curriculum. For your short-term outcomes, you want to identify what's going to happen as a direct result of your project's activities. I like to make this column about changes in knowledge and ability, um, basically what your project's beneficiaries, whether it's faculty or staff or whomever, what they should know or be able to do as a result of the work that's supported by your project. They don't always line up that way, but that's, that's where I start with mine. So at the next level, midterm outcomes, you want to show how you're meeting that need that you identified early on in your proposal's rationale. We didn't talk about rationale. We're not going to in this webinar. But you do need to make a case of why your project is needed. So in this example, um, we have more students entering green energy technology careers and employers hiring graduates. So presumably in our proposal narrative, we would have said that we know this is something, there's a, there's a need in our, in our discipline, in our region for this work. And at the highest level here, there should be a really clear linkage to the purposes of the ATE program. You're not going to be able to bring about these changes all on your own necessarily, but you should be able to demonstrate a logical connection with what you're trying to do and what, what the ATE program is trying to do nationally. And this is a good way, I think, to reinforce your project's alignment and fit with this program. As you know, it's a lot of work to put together a good proposal, and it's a shame if you submit to a program that doesn't fit your project or if it fits, but reviewers just don't see how it fits. You want to be real clear. And, this, and I think the logic model can help you do that. So if you want to include a logic model in your proposal, you want to keep it to a page or less. Um, some people put it right in their proposal narrative, um, and some people put it in their supplementary documents. You just want to keep in mind that what you put in your supplementary documents um, may or may not be read, be read by reviewers. They're not required to review those things. Um, so again, this is a means to visualize and communicate really the key aspects of your project and how they're fitting together in a cohesive package. But I think they're quite useful for evaluation planning, and that's probably why people tend to see them as something that evaluators do. It's an evaluation thing. Well, it's really a thing about to convey your project, which is helpful to the evaluation. Um, and I think a good place to start is to think about the general types of questions that could be asked with regard evaluation questions, questions you're asked that will drive your evaluation with regard to each of these levels. So I think it's helpful when we think about focusing the evaluation to go through each level of the model and sort of think about the questions that you might want to ask about the quality and impact of your project. So here's some really, really generic examples. At the activities and outputs level, um, you want to be able to answer questions about who you reached, what they thought about their experience with the project, what the quality of the utility of the project's activities and projects are, products are. And this is largely accountability kinds of information. It's really important to have this, but the evaluation shouldn't stop there. For short-term outcomes, the evaluation should determine how the project affected participants' knowledge, skills, abilities, attitudes, if that, in fact, was the focus of the way the, the short-term outcomes were articulated. Next, the evaluation can progress to answering questions about changes in what people are doing, their practice, their behavior, um, assuming, again, that that's the way the midterm outcomes were framed. And for long-term outcomes, your evaluation may not actually get this far down the road, especially if in, you're in your first cycle of funding, it's your first grant. If you can, all the better. So here you might look at the cum cumulative effects of a project's outcomes. Um, what was achieved that can be sustained? What was transformative about the project? It really depends on the nature of the project, but here you're pushing to demonstrate the project's contribution to those ATE program level goals, and that there was some sustainability to those changes. Um, you, there's a lot of things you could look at in an evaluation. You may not have the resources to address them all, so you'll probably have to prioritize what's most important and what fits the stage of your project, and that's really what focusing the evaluation is all about. So again, these were very generic kinds of questions, um, and you want to tailor the focus of your evaluation based on what your project's doing. So we're going to try to work through an example together, so get ready to use the chat box. Um, 
I just put the model up again to give you a moment to reacquaint yourself with what's in it. And then we're going to work on how to map evaluation questions and data collection onto it. Because again, it's all about aligning the evaluation plan with a specific project, not proposing you know, something overly generic with, with your evaluation. And somebody in the chat, I wanted to point that out, talked about um, using the framework as a means to kind of organize your narrative. And that is a wonderful piece of advice. So, there, the key piece, the big chunks of in your logic model should also be the big chunks of your of your narrative. There shouldn't be surprises or misalignment in either of those places. So that was, whoever said that, thank you. That was a wonderful point. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, let's say we have an evaluation question we could pose um, about short-term outcomes. Could be like this. To what extent and how did faculty implementation of course modules affect student interest in learning in green tech? Well, first of all, there's a lot packed into this question, I realize. So we will want to unpack it into its component parts, which are what? what are, there's a lot we're asking about in here. Can you just use the chat box to um, kind of pick apart all the different pieces of what's being addressed in this question? All right, so student learning and student interest are two different things, and we would need to measure them separately. Joanne pointed out student interest as, as well. Um, Sam says retention. Faculty implementation, says Joanne. Good point. So we have, you know, did faculty implement? We might even add, throw in there, did they implement with fidelity? Um, and then people have pointed out we're looking at student interest and, and learning as well. So there are a lot of different things going on here. So um, next I'd ask you, what kind of data could we gather that would help us address those different things we want to measure changes in? Yeah, think of it in terms of evidence. So M Fields from Lane Community College says, yeah, a survey, that's a great way to get um, information about student interests, assess of student surveys of students, assessment, right? John says assessment. If we're going to measure learning, we got to have some sort of assessment to get at that. It's probably better than self-reports, for example. Um, Bob says enrollment. That's even that's a great. That's very independent measure. Good. So you guys, you guys get the hang of this. So you'd want to hone in on what your outcome is frame a question around that, and then really pick apart the kinds of evidence and kinds of data you would need to be able to demonstrate um, change and impact there. All right, let's do it the other way around. Let's just look at this. Um, let's look at midterm outcomes. Here are two we have here for this project. Um, what are some evaluation questions we might want to ask at this level of the model? What would we want to know here? I want to ask about job placement, says Alice. Can you frame this in a question? We said our evaluation is going to ask what? Questions are just really a means of, of focusing, uh, kind of declaring what it is you're going to be looking at. Paula says wages. So the simplest thing to do, and NSF is very interested in you know, finding out whether you met your goals or not. A simple way to, to frame an evaluation question around outcomes is to say, to what extent, you know, and just what's your objective and then put to what extent in front of it. To what extent do graduates enter green tech or increase uh, employment in green tech careers because of the project? To what extent were regional dem demands for green technicians met? That sort of thing. So you give, you've given a lot of good examples uh, for data points. Sam says, what percent are employed in the field? Claudia says, do grads get green jobs? Do they have livable wages? You guys totally get this, right? So you, what you want to do is match questions to data. Um, don't just throw out we're going to look, at, we're going to address these aspects of our evaluation and not, and not give examples of data. And don't just list data without, you know, pointing to what it's going to indicate about your project. So you guys definitely get the get the hang of this. Um, another way to look at it, I mentioned rationale again. So. When you wrote your rationale section of your proposal, there must have been some evidence. You must have been able to point to some evidence of the need for the type of project you're proposing. So if possible, you can consider whether that, you know, how you made your case, if there's examples of evidence you could use down the road retrospectively to show whether your need was met. 
Well, thanks for doing that. Okay, so it's always a good idea to check the evaluation's focus to make sure it makes sense in light of the project's age and scope. So if the proposals for, for example, continuing an existing program or beefing up a, a prior project, you want to be able to go a bit farther with the evaluation than you would with a, a brand new endeavor. So it's just a matter of alignment and hopefully your evaluator can definitely help with that. So after you articulate the focus of the evaluation, you can then describe the data collection plan. There's really some basic things you need to convey. What information do you need? How will you collect it from whom and when? So this is an excerpt from a real proposal for an evaluation. It was not from an NSF proposal, um, but it is real. I did shorten it a bit, obviously, for the presentation. So you're probably ahead of me in reading this as I talk. So I just want to highlight some key words for, for you. So the evaluation is going to use mixed methods. It's going to gather both qualitative and quantitative data. It's going to be both formative and summative. And it will assess the project's merit and worth. And it's going to adhere to best practices for rigorously scientifically based, I want to head myself, research. All right, so that sounded good, but you already can tell I'm not, I don't really like it, right? Uh, this is not what you want. This did not provide any of the key information about the what, how, who, and when of data collection that we really need to know. This is a very generic cookie cutter description, and it's likely what you'll get if you're a proposer and you wait to the last minute to engage an evaluator, because they simply aren't going to have time to do something really tailored to your project. So now I'm going to ask you to do a little work here. Again, going to use your chat box. This is a different example of a description of a data collection plan. Um, think back to those four questions. And I'm going to ask you to read this, and then I will post you, ask you to answer some questions about this excerpt of a data collection plan. So just take a minute to read it on your own, and then I'll ask you to uh, give your answers in the chat box. Okay. So first of all, what type of information will be used for this evaluation? What data will be collected? Darlene says qualitative data. Joanne says participant feedback. Katie, yep. Anyone else? Student use of the information. Paula says survey data. Yep, so there are some, the key things here are participants' feedback, as was mentioned, evidence of application, yes, and students' knowledge and perception. So some of you pointed out it was qualitative, right? May or may not be qualitative data. We could get participants' feedback in quantitative form, for example. We could ask people to rate the extent to which they applied. Okay, next, how will the data be collected? John's already ahead of the game, survey, interviews, we're using a random sample. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward here. Surveys and interviews, the key data collection methods. Okay, who are we going, who are the sources of the data? Samantha says, students. Sam says participants and students. Yep, perfect. Um, participants and students, those are the main data sources. And actually the example also mentions who will do the collecting uh, is the external, the staff and the external advisor. That's who's collecting the information, but the sources of information um, are the participants and the students. So finally, when will the data be collected? Can you tell from this example? Claudia, end of each semester, the end of period. Yep, you guys got it. It's pretty straightforward, right? You didn't have to guess. Um, it will be collected end of workshop, six months post-workshop, and the end of each semester. Now, 
clearly this is just three sentences from what should be a one to three page description of your evaluation. So it's really just a small example of how data collection, again, which is just one component of an evaluation plan, might be described. But you can see even in this little example, we packed a lot more concrete information in about the evaluation plan than that prior example, which was really giving us the buzzwords that make it sound important, but really just gave us no examples of no concrete examples that of, of what data would be collected or how. So here's an alternative way to present the same information. Um, it's pretty efficient. It's a matrix. And you can see that here we've aligned everything up with our project goal. And then we have our evaluation question, which is aligned with that goal. Then we list the indicators. And these are just the pieces of information we're going to collect. And we're going to use multiple measures. And that's going to help us with triangulating our findings. And that will strengthen the evaluation. And in the next column, we've specified the sources of data um, that we're going to use related to those indicators, followed by the timing. And there, I know there's a lot in this slide, and these slides are posted on our website. So if you want to review this more um, and more leisurely, you're welcome to do that later. So just some tips for putting together an a data collection plan. You want to think about it in terms of building a body of evidence using multiple sources, including both quantitative and qualitative data. It's great if you can embed data collection into regular project activities. If you need students to do a survey, for example, you can, if you can just have them do it as part of the class rather than tracking them down later, that's great. Um, if you can use existing data whenever possible, that's always advisable. Get to know your institutional research office staff. Also mentioned pulling a team together on campus, and that would be a key player to get on board if you, if you can utilize those data. And use, use, use existing instruments if you can, if they match your needs. That will save you a lot of time developing and validating new ones. So just a bit more here on evaluation plan. Um, next we'll talk about analysis and interpretation. This is really about how you're going to make sense of the data, what sorts of comparisons will be made, what counts as success. Analysis and interpretation tend to get lumped together, but they're really different things. Um, analysis is organizing, transforming, and describing data very basically. And interpretation is making sense of the analyzed data so that those conclusions can be made about a project's quality, its progress, its impact, whatever you're, however you're focusing your evaluation. And interpretation requires some sort of comparison. Um, earlier we had, we had the example of 50% of interns obtaining full-time employment at their internship sites. So what else would you want to know to determine if this is a good result or not? What could, what, could we, what could we put around that percentage to help us interpret it? Use your chat boxes to tell us what you think. Yeah, so Howard says a baseline, good point. Comparing to other programs, says Sam, those are good examples. Compare, also says comparing to national averages or projects. Exactly. Perfect. That's a, a lot of the examples I had. So um, you could look at, as was mentioned, the prior the historical data. Uh, you might look at the time spent on the job market by people who, who are in other programs or the people who didn't have those internships. Um, and when you think about ATE in general, the kinds of projects that are done, the kinds of data that are collected, can you think of examples um, types of data people can use to help them interpret their own results. Things that might work across projects. Yeah, pre and post is a good example. Other thoughts. What can we use? I mean, we have data from our project. How do we know that that's a good result or a bad result? This is not easy. Did I really stump you guys? I don't believe it. I think you guys are multitasking. Someone's checking their email. Stop checking your email. Predetermined criteria, right? So we can look at um, things like as simple as we set a project target. We set a project target. Um, did we reach it? Did we? Um, how does our data compare nationally? How do other sites do? Something to bring meaning to our data points and help, to help us make sense of it. 
So finally, you should touch on reporting and use of findings. And remember that one of those uh, ATE specific review criteria is about are you going to make the results available? Are you going to learn from it? Will you share it with others? So keep that in mind when you think about reporting. You at least need to describe in your um, evaluation plan what types of reports will be developed and when and how the results will be shared. And you want to keep in mind here that you'll need to provide information from the evaluation in things like your annual reports to NSF, your annual survey of grantees, your reports to advisory groups. I want to point out here that there is a lot more information about how to align your project scope with your evaluation and any research components you may have. Um, in this document, the Common Guidelines for Education Research and Development, they are developed jointly by the Institute for Education Sciences released about a year ago, and it provides a lot of information about the different, different levels of development and research and the kinds of designs and evidence that are appropriate to each level. So I just want to emphasize here, check this out on your own. It's not a really long document. It's, uh, if you Google the name, it's the first thing that comes up, um, and we'll also send you a link when we follow up to the webinar. So we've, we've talked about result to prior support and the evaluation plan, and I want to just Mention sustainability and dissemination. We're not talking about them in this webinar, but if you go to the um, our website, there's a web a clip from a webinar from last year, the ATE Central, presented on these issues as well as social media, um, data management, and that kind of thing. So we encourage you to check it out. So we're coming up on our next uh, little check-in quiz. So get ready to use your markers and have a little fun, uh, and then we'll hear from our panelists and have another question break. So it's best if an evaluation includes both qualitative and quantitative data. What's your opinion about this? Everyone's agreeing. So if you have a good reason not to include both, that's fine. Just make sure you explain it while you're relying on one kind of data over another. But definitely a, a good place to start is using both. Evaluation reports are submitted to NSF only at the end of a grant. True or false? You got it. You're going to need to provide information from your evaluation annually. A little bit something different you do at the end is something called a project outcome report, and that you do only at the end of a grant. Mixed methods evaluation studies are recommended only for large scale projects. False. Very similar to the qualitative and quantitative. If you can use multiple measures and methods, it's definitely going to strengthen your evaluation. Okay, I want to move on to our panelists. So we're going to hear from Cheryl first. Uh, she, again, she is the evaluator for OSSA's newly awarded project. So, Cheryl? Thanks, Lori. Um, well, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about um, uh, the way that uh, OSSA and I worked together. Um, and uh, we had a number of conversations along the way as we um, worked together for the evaluation section of the proposal. And also, I, I think I should have said before that when I talked about my philosophy of evaluation, I have a strong collaborative model that I use, which means really, um, really clear communication and really being on the same page in terms of what's, what's the project about. Um, so. Uh, as we had those conversations, um, it became clear that they didn't really know what a logic model is, and I really do find the logic model to be essential for developing an evaluation plan. Um, and so once we were far enough along, I developed an initial draft, since um, that, that team really wasn't familiar with it. But then often I talked it through, and we made changes together to clarify uh, what, what the project was really about and to make sure that we were really clear, especially about outcomes and impacts. Um, and uh, I think John mentioned this uh, in the, earlier in the uh, webinar in the chat box, but in addition um, to providing the basis for an evaluation plan, it, it, it can also highlight strengths and weaknesses. Um, and really look at the theory of change. What is our theory of change? And is it, um, is it logical? Is it consistent? And is it compelling? And then the grant team can use weaknesses that we find, um, gaps in thinking to then strengthen the proposal, which is 
really how that worked for us. Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Let's um, turn it over to Asa for her thoughts. Um, yeah, I, I concur with what Cheryl said that I was very clueless when it came to um, both logic plans and um, evaluation models. And so um, I really relied heavily on Cheryl when it came to that aspect of it. And she showed me a lot of things that I could strengthen in the rest of my project description, not just the evaluation part of it, uh, in terms of, okay, that's the goal that you want to accomplish, but how are you going to measure whether you accomplished it? And that's where um, it was really valuable to be able to have her review the whole plan, not just the evaluation plan. Um, and then I think we just got higher profile on campus and were taken more seriously um, because we had an external evaluator. Um, but Terrell also pointed out when it came time to figure out how to do the budget that we could use our institutional research office um, to you know, cut down on the cost of evaluation by having them involved in creating surveys and distributing surveys and so forth. So um, that was really helpful. Um, I think that's pretty much all I have because I am still pretty clueless when it comes to evaluation models and I'm still heavily relying on Terrell. So I'll, I'll <laughs> turn it over to Gerhard. Thank you so much, Elsa. And here, um, Gerhard, if you can give us some, some thoughts, please. Yeah, the, in listening to the talk on evaluation, I, I became aware of something. You need to really consider when you need the data. Um, if, if many of the, much of the data, particularly the midterm outcomes that were described, you can't get in in term in um, in the three-year project. So you need to think a bit. I mean, you can still try to get those data for the future, and should plan on it, but if you're going to write a subsequent proposal, you want to be able to have uh, the data to, to back that proposal. So uh, you need to think a bit about what data you need at what time. Uh, I would also push the alignment with the goals. That is, uh, particularly the evaluation should be tied to outcomes. And if you have something in your logic model and you're going to evaluate it, say so and, and say how. You don't have to evaluate everything. Uh, I think you, you can make a case. Uh, and again, this use of instruments, um, everybody seems to be developing their own instrument. It may be useful to talk to somebody else in the program, and the AT program is very collaborative, uh, and find out what instrument they used. Uh, in other programs, uh, or, you know, the people will say, well, I'm going to use released items from NAEP or some other national exam. But then the, the methodologists come back and say, well, what's the reliability and validity of your assessment that's only that's using these released items? Released items have been proven reliable and valid, but in that context and not in your context. Uh, I guess I would push a little harder on, on the uh, common goals for educational research and development. Uh, it talks about types of projects. And the appropriate evaluation um, and research uh, for each of these projects, and what questions you should ask. Too often, people are trying to give evidence of causation, or all they can do is give evidence of, of promise. So, if you ask a question and or state your question in such a way that you're you're showing promise that something will happen rather than causation, uh, you it, it, I think lowers your your evaluation and research. Um, Rig uh, rigorousness. Thank you, Gerhard. Um, let's go ahead into some questions. Lori, Matt Swinton is wondering, um, he had a question about how much space, given that there's limited proposal space, should the evaluation plan, what, I guess proportionally, how should the evaluation plan focus on different elements from the logic model in, in terms of short, midterm, and long-term outcomes? Well. You know, it really depends on the scope of the evaluation and how prominently it figures in, in your project. But, um, you know, you have one to three would be a lot. I was, I'm recommending one to three pages for the evaluation. And it really should focus on what, you're, what questions you're posing and what data you're using. So, I mean, I can't give you a hard and fast rule there, but, you know, that the data collection plan is going to be the bulk of your, of your evaluation plan. And probably one and a half to two pages for the evaluation plan is more realistic. 
Okay, good, thanks. And you know, you had everybody um, so engaged in the actual uh, work and questions you're asking within. We didn't get a lot of questions to pose to our um, panelists. So let's go ahead and move into the third section. Great. So um, we're going to be looking at the more administrative aspects of your proposal now. Um, you know, the, the hard work is done once you get through the project description, really. So you do want to have evaluation in evidence in your references. It helps demonstrate the evaluator's knowledge and competence. can help show how the evaluation is grounded in, in and building on current knowledge and practice. And if you're using a specific evaluation approach or instrument, you want to be able to provide citations for that. The evaluator's bio sketch should reflect um, their past experience in conducting project evaluations. You want to use the two-page NSF format for bio sketches, which looks like this. Um, you should actually include it in the supplementary document section because the Fastlane system for uploading bio sketches is for senior project personnel, actually. Of course, the budget and the budget justification is an important part of your proposal, so you definitely need to have a line item for evaluation here. You may recall this quote um, from earlier in the webinar, and the rest of it is that the requested funds much, must match the scope of the proposed activity. So that's not terribly specific guidance. Um, so I was going to do a poll here and ask you to indicate uh, what average you think, what is the average expenditure on evaluation in the ATE program? Um, some folks are already answering. That's great. And we can kind of get the results up pretty quickly. Mike, you want to go ahead and post because people are already answering. B, you got it right. The average is 8%. Um, that's right. So the rule of thumb is actually 10%. That's just in general in evaluation. We kind of start there and go up or down depending on what's needed for the evaluation. But in fact, in reality, in the ATE program, it's 8%. So that's kind of a benchmark for you. So what goes into the budget? Well, the main costs are going to be time, travel, and materials. I mean, no surprise there, right? The ex biggest expense is time and travel. Really here for time, you need to be able to articulate how many days the evaluator is going to need to deliver the, what you need in terms of services and, and deliverables. And the evaluator is going to need to provide um, their daily rate and the number of days in your budget. Travel, you want to think about, do you want them to come to the PI conference, for example, committee meetings, special events, will they need to travel to collect data, do you want to meet in person to discuss the evaluation. You want to be realistic about travel costs because um, it can be quite expensive at times. If you can find somebody local, that can help you save money as well. I want to point out here, for if you're doing an evaluation as a consultancy, and Gerhard mentioned this earlier, um, you're going to describe the evaluation cost in the budget justification section under in other direct cost category. So you'll want to explain the evaluator's daily rate, their time committed to the project, travel, and materials. Now, if you're doing it as a subaward, you will have to have the evaluator prepare a detailed budget um, and separate budget justifications, just like those done for the primary project. And you'll use, um, they'll use NSF's budget template for this, which you can download from Fastlane. So that takes us all the way down to supplementary documents. What goes in here? Well, you'll need a commitment letter from your evaluator demonstrating they are committed to work on the project, they're able to do it. Um, You'll put the evaluator's bio sketch here, as I mentioned, and you must include a data management plan. Data collected as part of the evaluation should be addressed in the plan as well as any other data or pro products generated by the pro project. Um, I'm not going to go through the elements of a data management plan. Again, I suggest you go to our website and view ATE Central's video on this um, from last year's webinar and in our most recent newsletter we have uh, a, a, a small article with links to lots of tools for this. So here we are at our last very quick, fun check-in quiz. So you already knew this, so I, why, would I, why would we even answer this? You already know this is, there is no requirement. Um, you just have to match it to your scope, and 8% 8, 8 is really just a benchmark. Okay, can you report your budget either as a lump sum or broken down by cost category for evaluation? That's actually false because whether you're doing it in a narrative description or in a budget template, you're going to have to itemize the days, travel, materials, and so forth. And last question, do you really need a commitment letter from your evaluator? Absolutely. In fact, I'll just tell you as a side note, once uh, 
Someone had written in that the evaluation center here where I work at Western Michigan University was going to be their evaluator, and we were quite surprised about that when they got funded and they told us. So we had not committed to that. So it's very important to do that. It's going to be more compelling to your reviewers. Thank you for doing that. So we're going to hear, I think I'll ask our panelists to keep their comments super brief here because we only have about five minutes left for questions. So Gerhard. Yeah, I'd like to just comment quickly on the data management plan. It really has to have two parts. One is the protecting the privacy of individual uh, students or participants, and the other is a way of having the anonymized data available to secondary researchers. Uh, this comes out of a, a problem with the um, climate change uh, data where people were accusing people of uh, scientists of withholding data. So it just has to have those two main parts, privacy of individuals and, and anonymized data available for secondary analysis. And I would just also push on the budget to demonstrate, it's, it really demonstrates your ability to manage a grant. Um, do you really need the maximum amount? And I think reviewers get a little bit uh, jaded when they see all the proposals coming in for $899,999. Um, so show that you really do need, that you know how to manage the grant and that you need what the money you, you, you requested. I think that's it. Thank you, Gerhard. Um, let's turn it over to Terrell for her comments. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to add, uh, talk about small projects for a bit. Um, for a small project, the 8 to 10 percent doesn't really hold. There are not enough funds for 8 percent even. So what Lori said uh, holds especially true for small grants. The budget needs to match the evaluation. and. It's important to remember that with a small project, the expectations regarding evaluation aren't, aren't as high. Um, but often with a small project, the flip side of that is often the goal is to start with a small project and to be able to, to submit for a full project proposal. So I'd, from my perspective, there's, there's an aspect of investment here. So uh, the 8 to 10 percent doesn't hold. Um, and it needs to match the budget, but on the other hand, sometimes we need to get the data in order to um, be able to prove the value of the project for future project uh, proposals. So um, intentionally, we may do more evaluation than the budget might reflect, and again, that's that investment piece. Thank you, Terrell. Let's turn it over to Afsa. Yeah, I think what Terrell said, the fact that we're, you know, getting a small grant means that you're probably gearing up to a larger grant. Um, so putting the evaluation plan in place so that you can um, increase the scope uh, was a big part of our planning part, and also something that Terrell, you know, informed us on. Um, also, in terms of the supplemental documentation, we put a very detailed logic model in the supplemental docs as well, but made sure that we also had. Um, a, a sort of more broader picture view in the project description since reviewers don't have to read the supplemental documentation but do have to read the project description. Um, so that was one tip that I would probably um, put in as well. And that's all I got. Thank you so much, Asa. And um, to respect your time, we just want to do a few um, slides for our end matter and get you over to our survey. Please visit our website where you can learn more about um, past events, new events coming, search our resource library, use our evaluator directory, download your quarterly newsletters, and access information um, from all of our past webinars. Come join us on all of our social media channels. And we're offering this webinar again on Tuesday, August 26th at 3 p.m., so invite your colleagues. The um, next slide will launch into our survey, and when you complete it, you will be taken to our Facebook page, where we would really like to encourage everyone to post your reactions to this webinar. So it may come as no surprise that evaluation is really important to us here at Evaluate, and we'd like your feedback on this webinar, as well as your ideas on topics that you'd like us to address in future webinars. This survey should be up now on your screen, and it will take you just a minute or two to complete. And after spending 90 minutes focused on evaluation, how could you not take the survey, right? So we'll leave the screen open. Moderators, remember, 
don't close the survey window on your screen. And while you're working on the survey, we'd like to thank you for the, your participation in today's webinar. Gerhard, Carol, and Asa, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. Lori, um, thank you so much too. And on behalf of our entire Evaluate team, we um, appreciate you being with us and hope you have a great day. Thanks so much.